So uh, this talk is being recorded. So of course, unless you ask a question, you are not going to be recorded. The coffee breaks which will happen right after the talk are not going to be recorded. So if you wish to ask a question, uh, indeed, you must have your audio and video on. This is compulsory. And if you wish to ask a question, uh, you can go to the participants uh, icon and there is an option called raise hand. So if you do that, then it's visible to the host. And then uh, depending on how the talk goes, you can either ask in the middle or at the end of the talk. Of course, uh, everybody is encouraged to ask as many questions as possible. And I request everyone to keep their audio video on because uh, it at least gives a feel of a physical seminar, right? In, this, in these times of uh, virtual uh, realities. And um, I guess that's pretty much it. So I hand it over to Dimitri. Dimitri, all yours. Uh, thank you very much, Krishna. Uh, this is, thank you for the very nice introduction and thank you to all OWL's organizers for for the invitation to give it a talk at YR Owls. This is a great pleasure to be speaking to so many people here. So um, I'll be talking about uh, Parikh's theorem from the complexity viewpoint. So very broadly, this is work on formal language and automata theory and on the foundations of verification. And the way this, this talk will go is that I will first uh, say a few words about what I mean by the complexity viewpoint. And then I'll move on to uh, talk about Parikh's theorem on its own. And then we'll merge the two, the two kind of streams and talk about Parikh's theorem from this viewpoint. So what do I mean by the complexity viewpoint? So here, I don't mean so much computational complexity, but rather descriptional complexity. And let me show you a slide with, uh, well, what's my opinion about this. So um, in general, for computational problems, you can think about what's the minimum size of a program that solves the problem. So what does the word program mean? Well, this depends on the computational model. So you can think Turing machines, but you can think also automata or different kinds or other formalisms. You can also think logical descriptions or regular expressions. So uh, to make this precise, uh, in formal language theory, if you, if you take a formal language L, then the state complexity of the language is the minimum size of an automaton, let's say NFA, non-deterministic finite automaton, that accepts L. Of, of course, you can make this definition parametric and plug in different models instead of NFA here. So this is kind of the complexity of the language itself. It's not related to the size of a particular one specific automaton, it's the minimum. So why do people study these measures at all? So why people look at the state complexity? So there are several reasons to, to do this. So first of all, general motivation is we want to understand what makes problems difficult. So if you want to do something, you can find Let's, if you want to accept a language, you can find an automaton for the language. This gives you an upper bound on state complexity. So what happens if you want to prove a lower bound? Then you want to show that all NFA that do something or all machines that do something, they are big. So this is a hardness argument. So that's item one here in the list. So, uh, but that's not the only motivation. So today, programs and their models become data because in verification, you know, you want to take a model of a program and analyze it. So, of course, you would like to have your data as small as possible, so as simple as possible. Therefore, it's interesting to study the minimization questions for various models of computation. But equally, if you want to show lower bounds on the size of machines, so limitations of models of computation, when you show limitations model of computation, this is really what you can use if you design analysis algorithms. So arguments and ideas that goes to lower bounds for state complexity or program size complexity more generally, they are exactly the kind of ideas that go into verification algorithms and analysis algorithms. So this is broadly the kind of the state complexity or the complexity viewpoint that I wanted to share with you. So, and kind of with this outlook or with this lens, let's go on to the Let's, let's proceed to Parikh's theorem. So what is Parikh's theorem? So let's first define a following mapping in the formal languages world. Suppose you've got an alphabet of R symbols 
And then you've got a language, which is a subset of sigma star. So the parik image of the language is the set of all vectors. Let's with arc. Take the word and forget the ordering between the between the letters. So, for example, if you've got uh, just one word a a b b b b a, then you just take the uh, the vector three four because there are three a's and four b's in this word in, in this language. So, uh, if you take uh, the language of all a m b m, then it has the same parik image as this regular language a b star, right? So this is just this kind of diagonal ray, m, m, where m is greater than zero. So this is the kind of commutative mapping uh, moving us from languages, subsets of sigma star, to subsets of n to the r, where here n means uh, natural numbers including zero. So, uh, so you can define this commutative mapping and think of it as a regular abstraction of a language. Uh, why regular abstractions? Well, uh, Rocket Parikh uh, proved this theorem in 19, I believe, 61, and then it was published in JACM in 1966, that every context-free language has uh, the Parikh image that is the same for some regular language. So for every context-free language, there exists a regular language with the same Parikh image. So at this point, this was a result in just automata and formal language theory, but it later became important for foundations of verification and uh, more practical topics. So let me discuss Parikh's theorem for, 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 for a while. So applications in formal language theory are, for example, as follows. If you take unary context-free language, then by applying this theorem, you will see that they are all regular because for unary languages, you can see that languages such as all words of quadratic length and all words of applications in pure formal languages, but then there are applications in verification of infinite state systems, and I'll mention a few later. So uh, over the years, uh, there have been many proofs uh, of Parikh's theorem involving different ideas. So here I kind of came up with some labels or metaphors to explain, to kind of attach to these ideas. So let me say briefly just a few words about each of them. Uh, just a moment of interruption. I'm sorry, Dimitri. Yeah. Uh, it looks like your voice is getting cut in between. At least I had that feeling at least a couple of times. Uh, and it seems for some participants, the video is also freezing a bit. Uh, for me, the video was fine, but the audio was like going off at least twice. Um, I hope uh, your net connection is uh, stable, right? I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe you can try speaking a bit closer to the whatever. Yeah, sure. So okay. Thank better? you. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so please carry on. Yeah. Anyone? Uh, everybody is muted. So, can you so say I'm giving you the collective response uh, from people and including myself. So, I guess uh, let's hope it goes well. You please continue. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, um, so there are multiple ways to, to prove this theorem about formal languages. So, one of them is what I call here safe unpumping, which is you'd like to look at the set of all long or big computations, and then you'd like to remove some parts of it, but in such a way that you can reinsert these parts still. So uh, very vague, I kind of very vaguely explain, I won't go into the details in this talk, but that's, I believe, how uh, uh, Parikh proved it in, in the original paper. So, uh, there are other ideas as well. So for example, Esparta, Ganti, Kiefer, and Lutenberga uh, showed a direct uh, NFA construction 
that uses the fact that if you only care about preserving the commutative image of a language, then it suffices to look only at words that you can derive using at most n plus one non-terminals at any point, where n is the number of total non-terminals in the grammar. So if you use this idea, then you can build a small non-deterministic finite automaton for, for, for the context-free language. But then finally, there is uh, uh, another idea that uses uh, Pressburg arithmetic that encodes uh, the balance equations in the kind of Kirchhoff law style uh, to encode the kind of the set of all words that the grammar generates. So all three of these ideas uh, have found other applications in verification. For example, uh, these small index derivations uh, give you safety verification procedures for, um, for models where you have several push down systems sharing uh, control state and then they write and update these control states concurrently. And uh, this Pressbook description has uh, also applications there. So um, what, so in, in this talk, I will look at, you know, Parikh's theorem from this complexity viewpoint, state complexity, and then I will talk about one counter languages, which is a subset of context-free languages, and look at what things look there. So let me move on to part one. So why Parikh's theorem from the complexity viewpoint? So this is the theorem itself from the complexity viewpoint. I will say that every context-free grammar for every grammar, there exists a, an NFA, an automaton A, that has at most exponentially many states, and that has the same Parikh image. So this is the refinement of the theorem as I stated it previously. So uh, this exponential upper bound is tight. So look at this simple grammar and read it from bottom to top. So a1 generates a word of just length one. A2 goes to A1, A1. A3 goes to A2, A2, and so on. So then the terminal with index n generates one word of length two to the n. Okay, that's quite clear. But then if you want to have, so that's a regular language. But then if you want to have an NFA that accepts this language, well, you must have at least two to the n states. So somehow the exponential, uh, uh, the exponential bound that I wrote here, this exponential blow up is somehow unavoidable. So let me look at an application of this complexity viewpoint. So Henny Kamaya and Old Dog defined so-called availability languages. So basically you can think of them as regular expressions that have the following additional feature. You can have a new symbol this checkpoint, and then you can group sub-expressions and say, oh, this sub-expression must satisfy some constraints. So typically, right, regular expression denotes a collection of words. Now this constraint tells you that you only want to keep words where each prefix that ends with the symbol, that each such prefix satisfies this constraint. And this is just a single equation or inequality. So let me give you an example to make this concrete. Suppose you look at A star, B star, C star, and then you have this checkpoint. If at this point you add the constraint that the number of A's is at least the number of B's, you kind of get rid of some words. But then you can insert the checkpoint again and then check another constraint, add another constraint that the number of B's is at least the number of C's. So, so this expression defines a language which is not regular. So look at this. This is this this looks quite complicated. So and you can kind of add other other constraints and so on. You can define non-context-free languages in, in this way. So uh, and you can kind of nest occurrences of these constraints and, and so on. So if you if you if you take such a, such a language, uh, which is a kind of natural thing if you want to if you want to think about concurrent systems and say, oh, every request must be handled and things like this. Um, then a safety verification question is whether this expression uh, generates at least one word, whether there is something that's satisfied by this expression. 
So it turns out what, what you can do is you can start with an automaton for the small language, then insert a counter that checks, uh, the, the, that tracks the difference between the number of A's and the number of B's. So once you have this counter, then if you kind of transform this to the Parik image, then you can kind of get rid of the ones that, you know, uh, that don't satisfy it. And then you go back to NFA and then you do this several times. So basically you, you want to convert one counter automata. So it's basically some complicated automata for these languages into simpler non-deterministic finite automata. So and then you apply the construction with this exponential blow up several times. And as a result, uh, you will get uh, a non-elementary tower procedure for deciding language emptiness. So that's, that's how, how this construction is used. But then if you think about this example, uh, you don't really need to have arbitrary context-free languages. You don't really start with a grammar. You start with a one counter automaton. So what is a one counter automaton? So, uh, okay, so, okay, let's, let me just browse through this. So, uh, so this relies on Parik image for one counter languages, which are basically languages of push down automata, where the stack alphabet is quite poor. There is just the bottom of stack and there is a non-bottom of stack. So basically you have a non-integer count, a non-negative integer counter, and you can increment this counter, you can decrement this counter, and you can check the counter for zero. That's all you can do. You cannot compare and kind of observe the actual value that the counter holds. So if you look at this automaton, for instance, it starts here with counter value zero, then it reads several A's in state P, then it can non-deterministically transition to state Q and read several copies of the letter B, each time decrementing the counter. So you cannot decrement the counter more times that you than you incremented it because uh, the counter must stay non-negative, right? So uh, this transition won't be enabled anymore. And then at some point you, you just uh, check for zero and accept. In principle, you can accept just with tests for zeros at the end. So the language is the set of all accepted words and the, all such languages are context-free. So uh, they, they sit between regular and context-free and this AMBM is an example of one counter language that's not regular. And uh, the set of even length palindromes is, uh, is context-free, but not one counter. So on the previous slide, we basically saw why it makes sense to look at the version of Parikh's theorem specialized from context-free languages to one counter languages. Why is that? Because, well, there are many results about these one counter automata and questions for them become undecidable quite easy. Language universality is undecidable by a classic result of Valiant and uh, language equivalence is in P space. This was proven quite early on, but then it took 40 years to show that in fact it is in NL. So this upper bound took 40 years. So there are many results about one counter automata. They're re really a classic formalism. But interestingly, shortest accepted words by one counter automata cannot be exponential. They are at most polynomial. So here I associate uh, Michel Lato with this result, but this was also implicit in, in some previous work. So what is this? Why am I highlighting uh, the statement? Because it breaks the lower bound that we saw previously. So recall there was this exponential upper bound in this theorem. And then we saw an example for a grammar for which the automaton has to be exponentially big. However, if the language is the language of one counter automaton, then the upper bound of course re uh, uh, remains valid because you translate this automaton into a context free grammar and then you're, you are at most exponential. But then the lower bound fails because this grammar really is not a one counter grammar. So somehow the lower bound is polynomial, but the upper bound is exponential. So this motivates the question of why you, of what, what, what would be the right complexity 
for going from a one counter automaton to NFA if you want to preserve the parik image. And if you go back to this availability languages, there was this tower decision procedure. If you have a polynomial bound here, then instead of this tower, you get just a single or doubly exponential lower bound or double exponential upper bound. So you really have uh, a huge speed up in, uh, in algorithmic verification. So this is how um, state complexity helps. So in the remainder of the talk, I would like to talk about the upper bound, a better upper bound for one counter languages, and then about a better lower bound for these one counter languages. So before we get to number three, it's interesting to see about, to look at number two. So, um, so we proved several years ago that if you start with the one counter automaton with n states, then two to the n is really too generous. It suffices to have just n to the power log n states. So this is a quasi polynomial upper bound. So this is basically two to the power log squared n instead of two to the power n. So, so this is joint work with uh, many people and we proved a few other results in the paper. So let me try and show you the pictures of my co-authors. So can you see, can you see the, the browser or can you only see the, uh, uh, not really, let me see if I can. Um, so this is uh, Fauzi Atik, do, do you see that? So this is uh, Petra Hoffman. Uh, this is Kumar from uh, CMI in Chennai, India. Uh, this is Prakash Saivasan, who is now faculty at IMSC uh, in Chennai. Uh, this is Georg Tseche from MPISWS. So uh, let me try and move back to, uh, to the slides. So do you see them now? Okay, great. So, so we proved this theorem, which has a much better upper bound. So uh, let me show you the proof strategy very briefly without too many details. So if you want to start with a one counter automaton, then you uh, go- Dimitri, Dimitri, sorry, we don't see your slides. Oh, okay, sorry, uh, let me, oops. Uh, we see Georg. Right, do, do you see the slides now? Yeah, 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 yeah. Brilliant, thank you, Krishna. Okay, so uh, what is the proof strategy for uh, this upper bound? So basically, you want to go into steps. So you want to, if you start thinking about uh, a one counter automaton, you first want to bound the number of reversals that this automaton makes. What do I mean by reversals? Well, this means that the counter, you start incrementing it, then you, st then you stop and then you start decrementing it. So kind of count went up and then it went down. So that's a reversal. So and then you can transform a reversal bounded one counter automaton into NFA. So let me show you how these steps work in, in a nutshell. So if you want to bound the number of reversals, you kind of have two ingredients. So the first thing is, well, the metaphor is you kind of stop doing a lot of busy work and thrashing. So imagine the automaton is some kind of man who, or, or, or someone who, uh, who, who just uh, has a desk job and sits and kind of keeps the counter. Now, various people co uh, keep coming and saying, oh, please increment or please decrement. Now each operation is quite expensive. So instead of doing it directly, that person can simply record it kind of in his RAM in the memory that he has a to-do. I need to increment by two. Then someone else comes and says, oh, increment another time. He doesn't really increment. He just says, oh, instead of two, I need to increment by three. Then someone says, oh, actually decrement. Okay, just by two. And then at some point, this person just goes and says, okay, let me flush the update into the counter. And then it goes on. So just this very simple idea of keeping a kind of small to-do list and then discharging the whole of updates in batches so this is quite powerful. You cannot really do this all the time. Your original counter value needs to be quite high, but that's kind of one of the first things. And then the second idea is that uh, if you only care about the Parikh image, not the language itself, then you can shift things around. 
right? So if you have a small cycle in, in, the, in, in, the, in the computation that increases the value of a counter, then you can try and do this cycle as soon as possible because the higher your counter, the more things you can do. And then if you have a cycle that decreases the value, then you can do the cycle as late as possible. So basically, if you only care about what happens at the very end, then you should do the things that benefit you most the, uh, as soon as possible, and then you should postpone the unpleasant things to the end. And with combining these two ideas, you can find another automaton that has small size, and such that if you only care about runs with a small number of reversals, where the counter doesn't change direction too often, then your parik image stays exactly what you wanted. So this is the first ingredient. So basically, you kind of get rid of small kind of small small reversals. So once you have step A done, then step B uh, transforms this into NFA. So what do you do for this? So uh, let me uh, show you this on a picture. Um, so uh, so you should be able to see um, you should be able to see a different kind of screen where I can draw things hopefully. So uh, if you if you look at the run of a one counter automaton uh, and you just track the counter value. So the run length is here, and then the counter value is the y-axis. So the counter can go up, then it can go down, then it maybe can go up again, then it can go down, up again, and down. So this kind of looks like a big mountain. So instead, you can represent this mountain as a tree. So let me pick a different color. So all these increments are matched with these decrements. So, in, so you represent them using just a branch in a tree. So my tree will grow from bottom to top, maybe uh, not very usually for computer science. But then you can see that here, there are kind of two sub mountains, one on the left and one on the right. So I will depict it with two branches, one here and one there. So this branch ends with a leaf, but this branch goes on and split another time. So that's basically the tree that you care about. And it's up to you whether you want to have this edge or you want to start right from here. So basically, all these kind of runs you can represent not by these mountain pictures, but by trees. So if you think about the run that has few reversals, because somehow there are not many changes here, then there is a relatively small tree. So then what your automaton can do is it can try and guess the tree from the root to the, to the leaves. It kind of goes here. So what it does, it basically guesses a transition here and the matching transition here, and then makes a move here. And then it guesses them kind of coupled in pairs and then proceeds to this. But then somehow it's not very clear what to do because you want to branch. So, in principle, if your tree is kind of long and kind of goes only on one side, so there are many branches that go only in one direction, but there is nothing that goes on the right, so it's kind of very skewed tree, then what you can do is you kind of here can remember what else you need to do, discharge this branch, and then go back here. Discharge this branch, go back here. So somehow, if the, if the tree is skewed, then that's fine. But then if the tree is somehow uh, bushy and maybe complete binary tree balanced, then that's difficult and that's what you don't want to do. So then the problem becomes hard. So what is the formal way of measuring this complexity of trees? So let me go back to, uh, to the slides here. So uh, you want the, the, uh, the complexity of measure for trees so that, well, trees with simple nodes are simple, unbalanced trees are simple, but then complete binary trees are somehow complicated. So that's the intuition. So, and this measure has existed for many years, so let me tell you what it is. So uh, suppose you want to evaluate arithmetic expression, and this is the intuition, forget about one counter automata for now, just Bear with me for a minute. 
Suppose you have a, an expression like this, where you have several specific numbers at the leaves, and then there are binary operations in these internal nodes, and you want to evaluate them. And imagine that you are CPU, a processor, and you want to just compute this. How many registers do you need? And, the, and suppose it doesn't really matter what these exact operations are, plus times doesn't matter. You really care just about, you know, keeping the stuff in the registers. So how many registers can you, can, you, can you do? Basically, if you load something into the register, then you can kind of ap uh, apply the operation to two registers and assign to one of the other ones. So these operations are just the ones that, show, that this tree shows, but it doesn't really matter. Suppose you load this into the register. I denote this with this uh, blue blob. And then I put 15 into the register. That's a different register. So, and then I take the sum, right? And then the first register holds the sum instead of the 14. But then I can forget about 15. So then into yet another register, I can load 92, then 65, and then I can apply this operation. Then I forget about 65. And then I continue in this way. So basically the number of registers is the number of blue blobs that I'm using. Right, so here the strategy uses four registers, right? So I had four at some point. So how do I minimize this? Well, if I do this in a different order, I can use only three registers. For example, if I start with a minus 92, 65, go here, then I go to this branch, 35, 89, star. Then I have, then I can do this division for this big subtree. And then I can do the last subtree and then combine. So I only use three registers. And what's the kind of, what's the answer in general? Well, the answer is general. The smallest number of registers is known by different names. It's called sometimes black pebbling number, or it's basically the strala or strala number or the maximum height of a complete binary tree that you can find inside the tree of the expression. So, and uh, Horton and Australia are basically ge were, were geophysicists. So this is not really computer science. In the computer science uh, world, this was first discovered by Yershov when he wanted to evaluate the number of registers they actually need for expressions. So a very nice survey by Javier Esparza and his co-authors is in LATA 14. So to compute this smallest number, well, what you do is you look at an individual leaves of trees and sign zero to them. And then for binary trees, if you have two subtrees, you look at the numbers that you need there and you compute the answer inductively. If the numbers are different, then you just take the larger of the two. And then if the numbers are the same, then you just add one. So this corresponds to a very simple strategy. If you want to evaluate an unbalanced something, then what you need to do is you need to go for the larger thing first remember the result, and then on the side, do the smaller thing. Because the smaller requires less, you don't really lose. But then if the, they are the same, then well, you have to evaluate one, you have to evaluate the other, and then go on. And this is uh, the smallest number. This has been rediscovered many times in many contexts. So what does it have to do with our reversals? Well, that's what we can use for our NFA because you basically want to guess this kind of computation tree and traverse it from root to leaves. And then when you have a subtree that you don't really go into, you record an obligation on the stack. Basically, this means that for some part of the computation, you need to go to this part later. So let me go back to, to that picture. So in this picture, uh, if you are the automaton that started here, then you go in this tree, so you guess this tree step by step from bottom here to top, from root to leaves, you proceed to this node. And then here, of course, the ideal thing to do is to remember that you need to do this thing. I didn't go there, cross. I continue on the left complete the computation, I guess that there is nothing here. I kind of reached this mountain top. At this point, I remember that I had an obligation to also go here on the right. And then I go here 
again, I don't go on the right. This is my new obligation. And I only cover the branch on the left. And then I continue in this way. In principle here, I only have one obligation, but in principle, I can keep several obligations on the stack. So, uh, so how many obligations do we need in general? Well, uh, if, you, if your tree has polynomial size, then log n obligations suffice. This is basically the largest Strahle number that you can have. And then there are only polynomially many possible obligations. And this gives you a stack where the symbols uh, are from a poly n size alphabet. And then the stack has height big O of log n. If you want to remember this in the control state, that's exactly the bound that you, that you were going for, and power log n. So this gives you this theorem uh, that builds from a one counter automaton, an NFA, uh, that has size n to the power big O of log n, and has the same Parik image. Of course, uh, I only now gave you a sketch and uh, hid many details kind of under the rug, but uh, that's the, the key ideas for the upper bound. But then remember that I started the talk by saying why we care about lower bounds. And that's what I want to ask you here because somehow this is not quite satisfactory. Can we do better? Can we do n to power big O of one? Is there always a polynomial size NFA instead of n to the log n? So and that's the third part of the talk where I will discuss the lower bounds. It turns out that you cannot really go, uh, move this further to uh, further down to polynomial. There is a lower bound that has the form n to the power some growing function. So this growing function is basically square root of logarithm. So in the upper bound was n to the power logarithm. And this log log n factor is really tiny. So this is, uh, joint work with Mikhail Valley from Moscow. And let me show you uh, his picture from the browser. So uh, this is Georg. And uh, this is Mikhail from uh, High School of Economics and uh, several other institutions in, in Moscow. So we worked, uh, we worked together on this problem and this is the result that I wanted to share and this will appear uh, later this year at Lix. So let me go back to, uh, to the slides. So how do you show a lower bound of which is super polynomial? This is a lower bound on the sides of NFA and proving such lower bounds is quite difficult. So the first attempt is, well, you want to argue that the automaton needs to remember a lot. And then if you look at the previous upper bound argument that I just showed you, a natural thing to try is to say, oh, we argued all about these trees and then the bushy trees were kind of difficult. Can we try to argue that kind of, there are many possible trees and the automaton needs to remember one of them. So uh, Dimitri, yep. Dimitri, just a moment. You have around five minutes left. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. So, um, so if you have many trees to remember, then the first attempt is to have an automaton that kind of has increments uh, interlude with decrements. So plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. And then you can repeat each operation many times. So basically up, ups and downs. So uh, why did I say that this corresponds to many trees? Uh, let me draw this uh, again in this, uh, in this picture. Um, Um, so um, if you think about these ups and downs, I can draw a very simple tree, well, two simple trees that kind of have the same sequence of operations. So if you look at these two trees, the, this tree goes up, then down, then up, then down, then up, and then down. So this kind of satisfies this spec. But then this tree also satisfies the spec. And somehow we can try to argue that if these branches are very long, so the automaton really performs these operations many, many times, 
then maybe it actually has to remember which tree it is in because it needs to remember like the lengths of individual branches. So that's the first natural attempt. Well, unfortunately, this attempt doesn't really work. Let me show you how to break it. Mm. So back to the slides. So if you want to accept words such that, you know, you, your counter stays non-negative. So these two, the difference between these two operations is non-negative. This distance is non-negative in the end you are zero. Unfortunately, you can just couple all pluses with minuses, right? So you need, you can do as many A's, A1s and 2s, then 1s and 4s, 1s and 6s. Somehow the automaton kind of can break all this three argument and do, just do something smarter. So what can you do instead? So if you still, if you want to remember in which states you visited on the way, so somehow you can skip some of these states. There are transitions all the way around, but only going from left to right. Then basically this automaton is provably the hardest example. Meaning that if you can do this automaton with poly n, then you can do with poly n everything. There are small NFA for all one counter automaton. So, but then if you can prove a law bound here, then you can prove the law bound. And this was something that was uh, kind of from our previous paper. So how do, you, how do you argue that somehow here you need to remember many subsets? So the question is what happens for a particular subset? And here the insight is the automaton should do basically keep track of balance. So let me define a new game, uh, which is, has on the surface of it nothing to do with automata, and then it connects to this problem. So consider Duke words, and instead of parentheses here, right, so open, open, close, and so on, I will denote symbols by pluses and minuses because I have the one counter automaton intuition that this is increment and this is decrement. So let me define the following simple game. You, it's a one player game. And in one move, you can erase a pair of plus and minus such that plus is somewhere on the left of the minus, not necessarily adjacent. For example, in the first move, you can remove these two. Then you can, when the goal is to remove everything. So you want to erase maybe these two, and then you remove everything, right? So that's kind of, you satisfied the objective. But then suppose you also want to minimize the width you seen during the play. And the width is the number of islands, kind of several blocks of signs separated by blank space. So for example, you start with this word again, it has width one because there is just one big block. Then if you raise these two, there are now two blocks. So now the width is two. If you now erase this pair, the width remains two, but then you erase everything and the width is zero. So then the question is, given a word, what's the best strategy if you want to minimize the width? Now let me define this, uh, let me call this just the width of a word. So the width of this, well, I call it repairing was two. So uh, the width of a, specific, of a specific strategy, but then is there other strategies that are better? Well, the width of a word is defined as the minimum width of all repairings, of all strategies. And then I have the following question. Do all words have repairings of constant width? Is there a magic constant such that all words, no matter how long, have bounded width repairings? Or alternatively, can we prove lower bounds on width of words? So it turns out that this is linked to these one counter automata. So the strategy is we prove that there are words or sequences of words that have unbounded width. Right? So there are words that require more and more blocks of islands, right? blocks of symbols. And then you prove that lower bounds on the width imply lower bounds of size on size of NFA. So basically you put the width of the word into the exponent. So you, your lower bound is N to power basically width of the word. So the word must be smaller than length n. It's small, it's length square root, but don't, don't worry about this. Basically, this is, these are the two main things. So how does it link to, to what we saw previously? You can show that every word has a logarithmic repairing. 
and this repairing kind of always picks up matching signs. And this corresponds to the Strali number and trees that we saw previously. So uh, ignore kind of the text here. Let me just say here that the Strali number that we saw previously, this is kind of the pebbling number. And here is another kind of uh, reference for, for the same sort, for the, for the same idea. So, however, these repairings are all simple. You kind of need to pair up, but actual repairings can be quite smart. Suppose you have a complicated tree here in the middle. W is a complicated word. It requires large width. If you have many pluses here and many minuses here, then these words actually have very tricky repairings, right? You start erasing pluses here and killing the word from the middle. And then you start erasing minuses in, on the block. So basically you read the word from left to right and your width stays constant. So somehow these non-simple repairings is exactly what NFA can do. They are kind of very, very smart. So and then if you want to prove lower bounds on the width, well, it turns out that you can do this and you can have words that kind of have length n and have this growing lower bound. And this gives you a growing, well, super polynomial lower bound on NFA size. So, uh, so in summary, the lower bound is n to the power of the square root of log, roughly, and the upper bound was n to the power of big O of log n. So, uh, of course, it's a, an open question what, whether you can close the gap. It's not clear how to transform NFA into repairings. Uh, you can transform NFA, NFA into repairings, but you cannot always transform back. So there are open questions just about the width and there are open questions about the size of NFA. So, um, so this brings us back to uh, Parix theorem from the computational viewpoint. So this is another version of Parix theorem, very refined for these one counter automata, but this is a lower bound on the complexity. So uh, instead of finishing with a summary of the theorems, let me finish with the first slide that I showed. So, I wanted to emphasize that I find it important to think about size or state complexity of various languages and various problems, because thinking about limitations about what makes problems hard, I think that's one of the key challenges in theory of computing. So thank you for your attention and thank you again for listening. Okay, so thank you so much, Dimitri. Uh, so to all the participants, uh, I think it's time for all of us to clap. So let me just try to, uh, so maybe you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay, so now um, the next thing is questions. So I would request people to raise hand in the, in your this from the icon participants and then maybe you can ask questions but before that i had a request so rohit you had sent a message uh, i think privately to me because uh, you know this messaging to everybody was kind of disabled about the pari theorem uh, so can you please uh, share that with everyone? That would be really nice. So I don't know if Rohit is still around or he's left. Okay, so I don't know, maybe Rohit is left. But perhaps I think, uh, yeah, so the message basically that Rohit had was, I'll just read it out. So Rohit says that he proved the theorem in the summer of 1960, when he was working with uh, Shomsky. And it seems Shomsky was paying $500 per month to him for that summer, and $125 per month for the next academic year. And it seems the result appeared only in 1961 in an MIT research report. And the journal version was indeed much later. So he says because of this, an unfortunate consequence was that his result on inherent uh, ambiguity 
It was also proven the same summer was credited by Hopcroft and Ullman to somebody else. So I think he, he mentions a textbook of Hopcroft and Ullman, I think, at this point of time. Okay, so now I would request uh, people have a question to raise hand. Okay, so, uh, so Dimitri, I think I have a question here. So can you shed some more light about this, uh, you know, this upper and lower bound gap that you were mentioning and some of the difficulties? Um, so if you look at these two functions as functions of n, then somehow yep. this log log n factor, this is really small. I don't think this is really the key thing. The gap is here between this kind of square root of log n. So okay. uh, somehow here, this was, this has been just the best we could do. We couldn't really make this lower bound higher. Mm -hmm. And somehow the challenge is that it seems very difficult altogether just to prove lower bounds on width of words. So, you know, in combinatorics, one of the natural ways to prove lower bounds on, 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 on objects is this probabilistic or counting argument that says, oh, look, if you only have, uh, let's say you want to have circuits of small size, then you can say, well, there are not many circuits of small size. Therefore, at least one function requires a large circuit. So this is non-constructive because you don't know which circuit requires, the uh, which function requires a large circuit, but you are sure that there ex exists at least one. So here, we haven't been able to find a non-constructive lower bound that kind of gives you a good estimate. So somehow we had to, do, to, to, to find constructive arguments, and they are very, very tedious. So this is quite bushy and kind of complicated. So in principle, I think there, there is a way to, there could be a way to, 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 to go higher from the square root of log to log, but it's not quite clear. Another option is of course to connect kind of to, to improve the, the upper bound from n power log n to something lower. But again, I don't really know how to do this. So, but in terms of just the bounds on the width of words, we really know very, very little. We only managed to prove these lower bounds for some specific words. So for binary tree and kind of for a stretched version of it, and looking at how do you prove lower bounds for other words is completely open. So somehow understanding these repairings seems to be the key to, to these lower bounds. It's not completely clear whether they will close this gap, but that's really a natural avenue. Okay. Okay, there is another question from Nath. So uh, Nath, can you? Yes, uh, can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, you mentioned these availability languages because it uses Parikh's theorem for proving the, the tower uh, upper bound. So do you think your lower bound ideas can also give you some lower bounds for, avail for um, availability languages? Give me a minute. Mm. I think uh, it's not immediate, but I think that's a, valid, a very valid quest. I don't know of a kind of a strong law bound on the, on the complexity of the emptiness question. So this is computational complexity. I mean, maybe a, another version of this is to, is to say, oh, in, uh, kind of, I want to find the state complexity of smallest NFA that has the same Parikh image as there, right? So somehow, instead of looking at computational complexity lower bound, I can look at the state complexity lower bound. But that's, I think, a very good question and indeed an avenue for, for future work. Thank you. So any more questions?
Okay, if there are no more questions, maybe we should thank Dimitri once again. Okay, so now uh, people who want to leave, I would request them to leave if they do not want to stay for the coffee break. So people who stay back uh, can of course join the coffee break. So. So the coffee rooms will be opened in maybe a minute or a couple of minutes. Hello. Hi. Hey, How's it going, Radek? Yeah, thanks a lot. Hey, That's very nice. Hi, Krishna. Hi, Radek. Hey. Okay, so... Radek, you're, like mu you're muted. Did you know that, Radek? So... Oh, yeah. Okay. So when I'm not... Hi, everyone. Hey. Hi. Where are you based, Radek? Ah, uh, uh, Currently, due to the virus pandemic, I'm in my parents' home in Poland. <laughs> Not in Warsaw, in some remote part of Poland that you don't know about, probably. Oh, I'm being invited to join another room. Okay, I'll move. 